Hello Facebook friends, we're going to get started here in just a couple minutes. Good morning, everybody. We'll give folks a minute or two to log on and then we'll get started. Hi Ayana, yes, this is Dad. I am excited to be with you again today. Hi Katie. Good morning, Paul. Hi, Tammy. Good morning to you. Oh, good morning, Mom. How you doing? <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Tad Yankowski. I'm the senior entomologist here at the Butterfly House, and we're coming to you live from inside our containment lab here uh, at the Butterfly House. So a lot of people have never gotten the opportunity to come inside the lab and see all the fun things that we get to do. Uh, most of you have just seen a little uh, peek, let's see, right, right through that window right there, or maybe that one. You've been able to peek in and see what we do in here, but we wanted to give you a little bit of a sneak peek behind the scenes tour of what goes on here in the lab. Uh, so I'm gonna flip you back around. We're gonna start over here. This is our emergence case. Now, normally when you visit, you would see that this would be filled with butterfly chrysalids and moth cocoons. Unfortunately, things are a little uh, meager right now, I guess we'd say. We're down to just about 25 or so butterfly chrysalids since we have temporarily suspended shipments of butterflies. But what you see right here are still sort of an interesting collection of butterfly chrysalids. This one right here, for those of you who turned in last week, uh, this is our giant green bird wing. This is our last one. Remember we had the green uh, adult emerge last week. Oh, and I just touched her and you can see that uh, she's wiggling there. And a lot of these ones here are swallowtail butterflies from Africa. These look like probably Papilio nereus which come to us from Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, a lot of people tuning in, a lot of friendly faces. Uh, most of them my relatives. Hi mom, hi dad, mother-in-law, father-in-law, good to see you all here. Hi Colt, good to see you too. So we only have a few butterflies left, but we still have lots of moth cocoons. These down here are atlas moths. Each uh, one of these has the 
the uh, largest species of moth in the world inside or outside like this guy who just emerged. Let's see if I can turn her around. You gonna, you'll be friendly? Let's see. She's got a hold of a bunch of different cocoons. There we go. Flop her down and we can get a closer look. She's totally fine. Let's see. And then there's a smaller male behind her. Beautiful animal. Will you come out and say hi? See if I can turn her around here. Now, interesting thing about the atlas moth that we see here is, if I can turn her around, we'll try to zoom in on her face there. She does not have mouth parts, or at least not functioning mouth parts. So as an adult, she cannot eat or drink. They eat lots and lots and lots of plants as a caterpillar, and they build up lots of fat reserves and energy reserves that they live off of their entire adult life. But once they become a moth, they no longer eat or drink. They only live for about a week. That's just long enough usually to find a mate and lay eggs and move on with the next generation of atlas moth. I'm going to put her back here. Let's see, do you want to grab a hold of that cocoon? You going to cooperate? There you go. All right. But as you can see, we're mostly empty. I'm going to grab these right here, and we'll talk about them in just a minute. These were blue morpho butterfly chrysalids, but the butterflies have come out. And you can see our other side of our emergence case. There's a few moths in there, a few more cocoons, but we're largely uh, empty with our butterflies right now. I'm gonna get you guys set up here. First off, I'm going to show you those chrysalids we were talking about. So our butterflies come in the chrysalis stage from butterfly farms all around the world. These ones here came to us from Costa Rica. Uh, El Bosque Nuevo is the butterfly farm. They're a nonprofit that they take all the money they raise from selling chrysalids to us and they put it towards a rainforest preserve, trying to save the rainforest. So we always tell our guests that every single ticket that you purchase to come and visit and every single membership you purchase helps to pay for our butterflies, which helps to save the rainforest. So you visiting helps save a small piece of the rainforest in Costa Rica. Now these shells here, they're very thin, kind of brittle. Once the butterfly is ready to come out of its chrysalis shell, there's a little bit of chemical reactions that happen. The shell thins just a little bit, so it's easier to pop open and separate. It's a very controlled method at which the butterfly comes out. This little uh, area right here, I call it the trap door. It opens up and then the butterfly climbs out and will hang from it and dry its wings until it's ready to fly off. Part of what we do here in the lab is dealing with these butterfly shipments. And every single week, um, when, when we're not shut down for a pandemic at least, we get anywhere from 500 to 1,000 butterflies shipped to us from butterfly farms all around the world. And so it's a never-ending process of taking care of the empty shells like this, preparing for the next shipment to arrive, or taking care of the healthy chrysalids when they get here. So, kind of cool. Thought you might like to see what the inside of a chrysalis looks like after the butterfly has come out of it. But we have lots more than butterflies and moths here in the lab. You may have seen a little bit. We have shelves and shelves and shelves of different animals. Over here we have our millipedes. We have a few beetles as well. We have some overflow from all of our praying mantids that we've received. I don't know if any of you uh, saw, but we were in the paper yesterday about the praying mantids that we helped uh, take care of that were confiscated by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Customs Department. So we have about, oh, four or five hundred baby praying mantids. They're all on this shelf too. Every single cup you see here has about four or five praying mantids inside of it. And they're all babies. We'll meet some of them in just a little bit as well. Some of them really, really tiny. You can see that little guy up there. He's hardly bigger than a fruit fly. And then we have leaf cutter ants, which some of you may have seen a little video earlier in the week of them eating some Bradford pear on a time-lapse video. We have a tub full of crickets. 
we have mealworms. Over here are more of our beetle colonies. We'll be opening some of these up in just a minute, so you'll get to see what's happening inside of them. This shelf here is filled with our venomous animals. So we have things like our emperor scorpion, our tarantulas, our vinegaroons, which aren't venomous, but they are predators, and we're storing them over here. We have assassin bugs, centipedes, all sorts of exciting things. Now, in just a couple weeks, we're going to be featuring an entire video just on our predators. So I won't dive too deep into them today because I want to save something to show you guys later in the month. Over here, we have some walking sticks. These are black beauty stick insects here. We do have lots of cockroaches as well. Now, next week is going to be all about cockroaches. I'm going to tell you how awesome these animals are, and hopefully by the end of next week, you'll be cockroaches as, uh, cockroach lovers just like me as well. But we'll see about that. We'll see what we can do. But I won't talk too much about cockroaches today because we're going to do a deep dive into cockroaches next week. All right, let's meet some of these guys up close, shall we? And feel free to ask any questions. I will review them at the end, but if I miss anybody's questions, I'm going to make sure that I log on and answer them uh, throughout the week. So for those of you who got here right at the beginning, you probably saw some of these guys. These are some of my favorite animals that we have here, and these are called blue death feigning beetles. Now, a lot of people want to hear that name for the first time. I think it's kind of scary. It has the word death in it. Maybe they're dangerous. It's really the exact opposite because these guys are kind of scaredy cats because they have a trick to protect themselves. It's plain dead. Death feigning means they fake death. And so these are blue death feigning or blue death faking beetles. Now this guy's totally healthy. But he wants you to think that he's not alive because he has an exoskeleton that's the outside protection, the outside suit of armor on his body because invertebrates like this guy have their skeleton on the outside of their body for protection. And it is very, very strong. If I were to take this guy after it died and I wanted to put it in an insect collection where we'd put a pin like this through them to preserve them. We would never do it when it's alive. Most insects, that's no problem. It goes right through their exoskeleton. These guys, though, are so strong that they will often bend a steel pin before the pin will go through them. So they know they're so armored and protected that they can play dead in things like lizards or birds or even scorpions will maybe try to eat them but they won't be able to puncture their really strong exoskeleton, and eventually they give up and leave the beetle alone, and then eventually the beetle will get up and go on with its life. Now this guy here has been playing dead pretty well. You saw him move just a little bit there. Sometimes they will play dead for only 10 or 15 seconds, but I've had some that were very committed and stayed playing dead for as much as an hour. Let's see, we do have a little trick we can try that sometimes will make them wake up. We'll see, this is just plain old water. I'm going to give him a little mist. We'll see if he starts wiggling when the water hits him. There he goes. His legs moved a little bit. These are a desert species. We get these from Arizona. There he flipped over. Um, they have this special blue color, which is actually a waxy coating that protects them from dehydration. So not only is their exoskeleton sort of a strong suit of armor, it's also waterproof, and it keeps all their moisture trapped inside their bodies so they don't dry out. All right, I'm going to put him back with his friends. There we go. Let's show you something else. How about some millipedes? These are giant African millipedes. 
and we recently got a whole bunch of babies. So these look pretty big, and compared to a lot of millipedes, these are these are pretty good size. But these are only a fraction of the size they will be when they're full grown. These millipedes can reach 15 inches and be about as thick as my thumb when they're full grown. A lot of people want to know what's the difference between a millipede and a centipede. Well, if this was a centipede, I would not be holding it because most centipedes this size could get, deliver kind of a painful little bite. Uh, centipedes are all venomous. Millipedes are not venomous. Some of them are poisonous, which means that if you were to eat them, you might get sick to your stomach or get sick. But a centipede, it has to bite you or sting you for you to get that venom. And then uh, if it bites you, you get sick, where if you bite a millipede, you would get sick. Now, there are some species of millipedes that can even produce things like cyanide as a defense mechanism. So most of them are pretty heavily chemically protected. They're going to taste really bad if you do try to eat them. But for... Uh, for these guys, they're pretty harmless. They like to uh, explore and move around. He's really looking if we have any food. He's gonna go wandering, we'll zoom out a little bit. We do have some food for some of these animals. These guys really like lettuce. So we're gonna give them some romaine lettuce today. Let's show you that we've got quite a few that have come out and are starting to look around. We even have a few soil millipedes that are living in there as well. These are animals that are native to Missouri and sort of hitchhike in on some of our mulch that we bring in to feed these guys. You'll also notice that we've got some isopods or roly polies that are in here as well. So, all right. I'm gonna bring you guys over to our ants. Now, right before we went live, I put that slice of apple in there. That apple's only been in there about five or 10 minutes now, and they've already probably a couple hundred ants that have found it and are starting to eat it. By tomorrow morning, that piece of apple will be totally gone. The ants do not eat the plants that they cut up. They are leaf cutter ants. They do not eat the apple or the leaves that they cut up. Instead, they cut it up and take it back to their nest, which you see around them here. And then it's sitting on a plastic box and they have nests inside the box. And they chew up that apple or leaf, or sometimes we give them orange or other things, and they sort of make a leaf paper mache mix that they grow fungus on. And they are farmers. They were the first animal to figure out agriculture. They grow their food. All this stuff you see here next to it, inside the box, is their fungus garden. The white parts you see at the very tip that's the ripe fungus that's ready to eat. The darker stuff around it isn't quite mature. It's not their food yet. Ooh, there's a big soldier ant that's sort of patrolling around that apple, making sure all the workers are protected. Let's see if I can show you guys a little bit of the entrance. No, the phone did not like that. We're gonna try to do that again. See if we can show you what's happening inside the colony. Just a little bit. Mm, kind of see it, it's a little dark. We have a few ants that crawled up on the phone, so we'll deal with those. But, so now see, they got disturbed from when I moved around in there, and now they're kind of scattering. They're issuing what's called an alarm pheromone. That's a chemical they release that sort of tells them, uh, tells all the other ants that danger is nearby. And so now they're moving faster and they're looking around. They're trying to find that source of danger, which was me, but I'm not going to hurt them, but they don't know that. 
You see those big soldiers are sort of patrolling around looking for any danger that they could attack. These ants can't sting, they just bite. They're not super big, but it doesn't feel really good to get bit, but it's almost like a tiny little paper cut. All right. So next we have, let's see if this balances, yeah. These are some of our jungle nymph walking sticks. These insects are still very much babies. They will get really, really big when they're full grown. You can see her right up there. She's kind of hiding. There you go. She's maybe two and a half, three inches long right now. When she's full grown, she could be probably between six or eight inches long. And if you count when her legs are stretched out, she could be even longer. She'll be one of the heaviest insects in the world when full grown. She can weigh more than a quarter of a pound. The males of that species are much, much smaller. But uh, the females get really big and chunky and they just stay on the plants where the males are smaller so that they can fly and find the females. And if we look up to the top of this cage, we'll see that there are a bunch that are hiding out on the top edge. Up there. All right. I'm gonna get some beetles and I'll be right back. So, in this box, we have one of our African flower beetle colonies. Let's see, can we see them? All of the adults are at one end right now, so we'll make sure we can see them. See them all kind of lined up in there? I'll grab a little handful here. Show you these guys. I think they're really pretty. Some people call them taxicab beetles because they have black and white spots. Other people call them African flower beetles. If you lived in sort of uh, Southern Africa, some of the tropical areas, and you wanted to have a vegetable garden, sometimes these would be the bane of your existence because they love to crawl into flowers and chew on the pollen and eat the flowers up. And then you might not get, you know, your fruits or vegetables that you're trying to grow. But in here, we feed them banana, uh, and, and they really like that as their food. Sometimes we give them flowers as a little bit of an enrichment treat. Now, this sort of dirt kind of stuff you see in here is their food for their babies. We're going to give them some ripe bananas here for the adults. They really like those. But I'm going to see if I can show you some of the babies. Let's see if I can find any. Here's one. that's showing. There's all sorts of babies. Most of them stay pretty deep down in the substrate. We'll see if I can find any real quick. I may have to pick this up and shake it just a little bit to get to them. There's another one. These guys are very prolific breeders. Anybody know what that big sort of brown egg looking thing I pulled out is? Here's one that has sort of a hole in the side where this one doesn't. So, I'll put some of these down. This guy's being really wiggly and movie, so I'm going to hold on to him. So, this is an adult beetle. They lay eggs in the soil in their substrate here. And they hatch, and then you get these grubs. These are baby beetles. They start off very tiny, just a few millimeters long, maybe a quarter of an inch. And then they get bigger and bigger as they grow. And then eventually, they form these, which are called pupariums. This one is empty because the beetle has already chewed its way out. But they form a pupa inside of that container 
just like a butterfly forms a chrysalis or a moth forms a cocoon. This is sort of like a beetle cocoon or beetle chrysalis. That guy tried to fly. You can actually see his wing sticking out from under his elytra, that special outer wing of the beetle. And you can see this guy, he's trying to squeeze through my fingers. He's trying to get back to that soil. Now inside this one bin, there could be as many as three or 400 baby beetles. If we were to pick through all of them, we'd find lots and lots of these baby grubs and lots of these puparians. This substrate they're eating is basically rotting plants. They eat rotting leaves, rotting wood. They're basically really good at turning old um, plant material into compost, into stuff that um, plants can use in the soil for nutrients. So these are one of uh, nature's recyclers, just like cockroaches, which we'll talk about next week. So as you can see, they're getting a little antsy. They're ready to fly. So I'm going to put the lid back on. some mantids really quick let's see if we can see these oh, we didn't like there we go so these are called ghost mantids these are really really cool animals these are just babies they molted once after they've hatched a molt is when they shed their exoskeleton to get bigger and they'll do this uh, three or four times uh, before they reach adulthood. Each insect sort of has their own number of molts that they do before they reach adulthood. These are ghost mantids. Over here are dead leaf mantids. Now you can actually see some of their molts. This one right here, let's see if I can point to it. That guy right there is hanging from a molt. That one looks kind of withered and small, that is actually its old skin. And you can see there's some fruit flies in the cup that are crawling around, that's their food that we feed them. All right guys, we are getting low on time. So I wanna make sure I have time to answer everybody's questions. So I'm going to come back to our death feigning beetles here for just a minute. And I'm gonna see if I can scroll through and make sure any questions uh, that you asked got answered. Let's see. I see, I think Chris is helping me out answering some questions as well. Chris Hartley, one of our other entomologists, he's our education coordinator is also been answering your questions. Let's see. I'm gonna rotate this just a little bit so we can better see. There we go. Lots of comments, that's what we love to see. Thank you so much for all these amazing questions and comments. Going through from the beginning, Paula, good to see you. We miss you here. Mom, Dad. Great to see you guys. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Colt. Hi, Anna. Hello, Sally. Good to see you, too. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Lucy. We do remember when you came in for the Keeper for a Day. That was a lot of fun. For those of you watching at home, we do offer a Keeper for a Day program here for kids 8 through 12. Uh, you can come in and get to feed and take care of all the animals you saw today and a whole lot more. You get to take a framed butterfly home with you. Hi, Leonora. Good to see you. Hi, Emily. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Kristen, for sharing the link to that uh, article. Uh, Josie, age nine, asks how many kinds of butterflies there are. And as Chris said, there's over 15,000 species. That's a whole lot. 
Now, there are way, way more moths than there are butterflies. There's probably 10 or 15 times more moths than there are butterflies out there. Uh, April asks, do their feet tickle? I think I saw Chris answer that too. Uh, sometimes when they hold on to you, it's almost like Velcro. They're really good at holding on. It maybe tickles just a little bit, but they're just really firm with their legs. It's kind of surprising how strong their legs are. It doesn't hurt or anything like that, but when they decide to hold on to you, it can be kind of tricky to, to peel them off. And yes, two weeks from today, we will be featuring our predators. So we'll be talking all about things like tarantulas and scorpions and centipedes and, and some bonus ones that, uh, that I want to save as some surprises. Hi, Kristen. We do not have any fire ants. Um, we try not to deal with anything that would be too venomous or too dangerous to keep here. Um, fire ants are uh, better left in their native habitat. And we try to keep them, uh, you know, from, from being invasive uh, outside. Let's see. Are atlas moths the only species that don't have mouths? Ah. Uh, let's see. Luna, Ian, and Mom find it sad that the atlas moth only lives to reproduce, then die. Well, so it's funny that you mentioned that with about atlas moths, because one of the other moths you can find around here that don't have mouth parts are Luna moths. All of the giant silk moths, those are the large moths that you find here in Missouri, do not have mouth parts as adults. Uh, there are many moths that do. Some of them are very important pollinators. But uh, a lot of the giant ones you see outside do not have mouth parts. Um, it is easy to feel sad for them, but the reality is nature is very efficient at what it does, and it just needs those animals to live long enough as adults to reproduce. But for the vast majority of their life, spent especially as an egg and then as the caterpillar, um, they can eat, and they are, um, you know, eating lots of leaves in the caterpillar stage. So most of their life they have a mouth part. They just um, don't need one as an adult. Aiden wants to know how poisonous fire ants are. Well, um, so they are venomous, meaning they can deliver kind of potent stings. And I don't know the exact number, but I know that if you get stung more than a couple hundred times, it can be what we call medically significant, that it could be medically dangerous enough that you need to think about going to the hospital or emergency room or dialing 911. Each individual ant doesn't have much venom, but it can sting you multiple times, and there are often thousands and thousands of ants in the colony, and so if you are... Um, you know, if you really disturb right where their nest is or, and lots of ants come out, you could get stung enough that it could be serious. Uh, but unless you're allergic or something like that, if you just get one or two stings, it's going to hurt, but you're usually going to run away and that's all that'll happen and you'll just have a, a bit of a memory not to mess with them again. So we talked a little bit about pollinators with the moths. That's a great segue for us to talk a little bit about our pollinator plant sale. Now, in the past, we've done uh, an in-person plant sale here in April on the weekends that a lot of you uh, come out for. We're always really excited to have 30 or 40 um, species of native Missouri plants and wildflowers available. Unfortunately, we are closed to the public, and that's making it a little bit uh, more difficult to do our normal plant sale this year. However, we have moved the plant sale online. So starting today, our website is going live where you can place your orders from native Missouri plants, and you'll have the option of either having them delivered within a limited uh, range of the butterfly house, or you can uh, visit uh, us and pick them up on scheduled dates and times. So we will be posting a link on our Facebook and in the, in the description here about our pollinator plant sale. So uh, you can check that out. You can get things like coneflowers and asters and milkweeds and all sorts of other great native Missouri plants that'll help attract butterflies and caterpillars to your garden. 
So, Becky asks, is there a reason why on the black and yellow beetles, some of them have more markings on their backs than others? And uh, my understanding is that is largely genetics. People have experimented a lot with selective breeding of them and gotten some that are, have much more yellow or much more black than others. But I think it's just randomly sort of their genetics the same way people may have different colored uh, hairs or some have freckles and things like that. So Denise, what we see right here are death feigning beetles. You can tune in earlier in, uh, in this video during the replay and you'll see that they play dead on command. It's very kind of cool to see. Uh, Paul asks, are atlas moths nocturnal? They are. One of the reasons we keep them in an enclosed area here at the Butterfly House is so it's easy to find them during the day because most of the time they would just hide way up in the trees and you'd never be able to see them. So I think that's about it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to check us out uh, next week, same time, uh, 10.30, and we'll be talking all about cockroaches. And I will do my absolute hardest to convince you that cockroaches are really, really cool. And I'm going to tell you all about the neat ones we have here. Also, uh, tune in. In just a couple days this weekend, we're going to be putting a poll out. And we might do some fun things where we feed the cockroaches something kind of cool, and you'll be able to vote on, on which food you want to see them uh, try to eat. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We love seeing you. And uh, I really miss you guys. And so it's really nice to be able to connect with you a little bit. We miss you here at the Butterfly House. Our animals miss you. And hopefully we'll see you soon. But in the meantime, we'll see you one week from today talking all about cockroaches. Thanks again. Again, my name is Ted Yankowski. I'm the senior entomologist here, and hopefully you had some fun uh, learning about bugs and what we do here in the lab. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.